This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Uh, we're continuing to talk with uh, Chris Caruso, uh, who's my guest for this session. Uh, Chris uh, just uh, defended his dissertation in the CUNY Graduate Center, and uh, We've already talked uh, in a previous session about the experience with uh, uh, the poor people's movements uh, over the years, over 30 years. Um, but one of the things I think we would like to talk about more today is the, the role of, uh, uh, of, of the new technologies and the communication technologies and IT and Internet and all that kind of thing. And uh, you've been in that field for 30 years, and of course it's changed a lot. Uh, and uh, you lived through the time when it was a kind of utopia for mm -hmm. the left uh, to the yeah. point where it's now the monopoly of <laughs> Google and Amazon and all the rest of it. So talk a little bit about uh, what you see as the progressive uh, uh, possibilities of, of uh, social media and how you think uh, uh, the way in which the poor people's movements that you know have uh, uh, utilized it. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, as you said, uh, you know, public opinion about uh, kind of the Internet has really changed over the years. That In the early days, there was a very um, almost libertarian but leftish libertarian sense that you know the right. information wants to be free and that you know we're going to break out of these you know stultifying media monopoly old media monopolies and we're going to have you know an, an unmediated person to person you know radically democratic um culture will be born um from the internet and that you know these ideas about intellectual property and, and copyright, um, that the technical basis of them was being undermined so that, um, you know, that we would see a, a further kind of loosening up and disruption of, uh, of capitalism. And there was, you know, and I was, I was part of it. You know, I, I definitely um, did have uh, these very utopian ideas in the early days of the internet. And as we've seen is this kind of progressive kind of walled garden approach, that that was always kind of there, that in the very early days there was a company called CompuServe that tried to kind of package the unruliness of the open web into a more easily to understand, uh, more usable kind of walled garden. And then, of course, America Online was in some ways the successor to that, which on the one hand it gave people, you know, a way to to put their foot in the water of the internet, but on the other hand, it, um, you know, prized um, kind of ease of use over kind of open access and, and freedom of information. And I think we've seen progressively, um, you know, a kind of uh, walling off of, an inter of the internet commons with the rise of what they now call a platform capitalism. And, you know, with Silicon Valley, um, you know, most people are not spending their time on, you know, the open web. Um, most people are spending their time, you know, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Google, on YouTube, um, which are these, you know, uh, enormous, you know, some of the largest uh, capitalist companies in the country. Like just in the past five years, you know, if you look at the corporations by their stock valuation, we went from, you know, General Electric and these big kind of general manufacturers and the oil companies being the the top five to now it's it's literally all of the the tech companies being this most powerful. Um, and, you know, of course, now, you know, much more critical views are coming out like uh, Shoshana Zuboff's uh, new book on surveillance capital is, yeah. I think, you know, an important contribution. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing that the way in which they're, um, you know, basically monetizing this kind of behavioral monitoring and even, you know, doing behavioral manipulation. And I think that, you know, kind of the pendulum has swung the other way in terms of, you know, folks are now saying, you know, uh, this is 
you know, this has been completely captured by corporations. There's not the room to move that there once was. But I, I want to have a little bit of a more nuanced view and say that although, of course, those powerful forces are happening and this increasing corporate control of the Internet is there, that there are still... Um, spaces in between, that there are still ways to communicate that otherwise, you know, weren't accessible with the old media monopolies. And I think, you know, poor people's organizations very early, um, you know, if you look at um, like the Zapatista uprising uh, against NAFTA, there was a, an undergrad at Swarthmore College, which wasn't far from UPenn, that was hosting the very early Zapatista like pages uh -huh. and manifesto yeah. on Swarthmore's server. I, I met him once when I was an undergrad as as well, which was a kind of inspiring uh, example. But that I think that, you know, these organizations of, uh, of the poor are incredibly scrappy and resourceful. And so, you know, have, have taken up these tools, you know, not just of the web, but, you know, social media, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram to begin to get sort of what I would call counter hegemonic ideas uh, to get, uh, you know, circulated in a way that I don't think there was the same uh, possibility in the past. And so I don't want to see, um, I mean, I want to acknowledge the dangers, the, you know, the overturning of network neutrality and, you know, the number of, um, you know, reversals of the old open open web and open net, but that I still want to say that there are spaces for um, for fight and for, you know, for class struggle and for new ideas that are, are possible on these spaces. Yeah, we're talking in one of those spaces <laughs> right here, so we can't say it doesn't <laughs> exist. And of course, yeah. uh, another, set, another place where you were a pioneer was uh, when you came to me, I guess it was around 2005 or somewhere mm -hmm. like that, and yes. said... Uh, Hey, we should put your capital class on the web. Yes, and uh, I was very skeptical and mm -hmm. uh, needed a bit of persuasion, and you persuaded me, and so <laughs> it went on the web. Fortuitously, it went on in what June of two thousand and eight, which yes. was about you know That's two right. months before the whole of capitalism crashed. Yes, and so everybody said, "Well, maybe Marx has something to say about this." So uh, we had uh, that, but. Um, there were a, a number of skeptical receptions to that. I mean, yeah. on uh, on you know traditional lines. I mean, Marx himself says about Volume One that uh, you know it's a bit hard going uh, at, at times, so that uh, you're going to only be speaking to a few kind of uh, dedicated graduate students yes. and the poor and the like who yeah. are not going to find this accessible or usable in, in any way. There was a, another kind of skepticism that uh, who's going to spend the time on a two-hour right. lecture uh, on a topic in a world which is all becoming increasingly about sound bites, and if you can't say it in what eventually became one Twitter entry, then right. it's not worth saying. But uh, there were a lot of myths around about what would or would not stick, and the, talk a little bit about the experience of doing the capital class because uh, I would not have had the faintest clue how to set that up and you're entirely responsible for uh, for that uh, so talk a little bit about what brought you to that and yeah well I mean of course your your reading capital class had already had a reputation kind of among the left among graduate students that you had been teaching it every year since 1971. And you know when I um, first attended the course, it was in the the largest room they could find in the CUNY Graduate Center. It was in the eighth floor cafeteria, and people were filled every chair, and were standing along all the walls. And you know, well, that you know, it was exciting. I mean, there was like a real electricity to the room, but still, that was only a few hundred people. And I, you know, was really thinking about the you know the organizers I had been organizing with in Philadelphia. Um, you know, the guy that handed me the copy of Marx in a takeover house and how, you know, people need to understand, have a more structural analysis of capitalism to as in part as a way to not internalize all of the self-blame of kind of their situation right. from their individual failure, right? And thinking about how, you know, how to spread this. And so, yeah, we um, against, I, I didn't, 
think it would have a large audience. I mean, I, I thought it would have a modest audience of kind of graduate students and leftists, but I, I thought it was worth doing. And I think it's safe to say that the kind of viral reception of it went beyond, well beyond what you or I had ever hoped for the project. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, by now the website that hosts the videos has over four and a half million views and that, um, you know, they've been viewed in virtually every country on the planet and that we've received, you know, hundreds and hundreds of emails from uh, Marx reading groups that are using your lectures that have sprung up, you know, in communities, in unions, in on campuses, in all kinds of, in prisons, um, all kinds of different places around the world who've been in touch that it really, um, I think, made a real contribution to the rebirth of interest in Marx and of taking Marx seriously. And of course, our sort of dumb luck for having it come out in the middle of the largest capitalist crisis in uh, since the Great Depression yes. um, definitely helped. <laughs> yes, no, 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 clearly, clearly it did. And I think uh, one of the things that was so interesting about that crisis was that many, uh, and even even the mainstream media would would say in passing that uh, well, I guess Marx might have had something to say about this, but then went on to say. Yeah. Nothing about what Marx right. might have said. So, <laughs> right. so, so it was fortuitous that way. But uh, tell me a little bit more, though, about uh, the, the you know the the, the the more technical side of how uh, poor people's movements can use this medium, not only for receiving information because yeah. that's what they would get from a, a, a sort of a reading capital class, but also how they themselves uh, can pick it, pick it up and run with it. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that's been, you know, most uh, gratifying is to see how people, you know, haven't just kind of passively consumed these lectures, but have like actively created, you know, derivative works, have made, you know, have pulled out shorter sections, say there's a section on, um, where you describe accumulation by dispossession, that just pull out there and wrap around some commentary about you know how that speaks to you know say water privatization in Detroit, or you know other contemporary issues, and you know the way that people have um, you know formed study groups around it, and I mean one of the most um, unexpected. Uh, things that happened was that this um, this translation project, right? That um, you know we started to get uh, emails saying, you know, this is great, but you know, could you do a version in Spanish? You know, could you do a version in Portuguese? And you know, we didn't really have any resources to you know get it to pay to have it translated. But it was I was always just yeah, well, you know, we'd love to, but I don't know quite how. And then people just then started to volunteer. They said, well, if you could come up with a tr English transcription, I could help translate. And so, um, you know, YouTube, uh, thank you, YouTube, uh, generated these auto automatic transcripts of the lectures and that we then put them up on a wiki and had volunteers from around the world correct the English transcription until it was solid, accurate transcription. And then we started to post it um, in ways that people could literally, so there was the time codes and the text, and they could literally translate as little as one sentence or as much as they wanted to. And collaboratively, thousands of people on a wiki we created for the purpose are now in the process of translating the your lectures on volume one of Capital into 44 different languages. And that every time a new... Um, you know, basically as subtitles. And so as those every time a new language subtitles is available for a class, that opens up a, a whole new audience um, for the class. And I think that's one of the things that has spoke to their, you know, continued popularity in that um, this this totally spontaneous crowdsourced translation project helps it, you know, renew an audience as it becomes available in, in more and more uh, languages and there was also like fascinating debates about you know how do you translate this word or this yeah, concept. No, I'm, I'm and, sure. I'm sure there's you know, a, lot of, a lot of people are wiping out previous right. translations. Right. I suppose. <laughs> yes. Uh, knowing knowing that world. Yeah. yeah. So there's like a field of contention there yeah. as well, and you know the the Portuguese Portuguese speakers versus the Brazilian Portuguese speakers, and how should you do this? Yeah. And, um, lots of those uh, kind of you know linguistic controversies, but um, you know has that. 
uh, something was we totally did not predict. You know, we we helped create an infrastructure to do that with you know by creating a wiki and by providing the the time coded transcript. But otherwise, it was spontaneous volunteer labor from people you know of all class strata around the world that have made you know some small or large contribution to that. And so I, I think that's really testament to you know how valuable people found these lectures that they'd be willing to to spend the time to do this. The other thing that uh, you know. Uh, last time when we were talking, you were talking about your experience with the Philadelphia Inquirer, that mm -hmm. they basically told you there's nothing you can do that we will ever report upon. Yeah. Uh, I think that's true of the New York Times, <laughs> you know, right. that there are certain things we can do which would never be reported upon, yes. such as, for example, uh, the Marx Project, or I don't think there's ever been a, a serious consideration of Marx in the, mm -hmm. in the New York Times, which... Uh, it's consistent with there's a wonderful story about that when when the, the Soviet foreign minister, as he then was, uh, 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 Gromyko, had been absent from New York for a long time, and he came back uh, to New York, and uh, the New York Times published a, a large kind of uh, reconstruction of his life and career and all that kind of stuff, and he was asked what he thought about it, and. Gromyko had a reputation of being one of the dourest, least humorous people in the world. And he just said, well, it's half truth and it's half lies, but we all know the New York Times is a well-balanced newspaper. <laughs> and I thought it was a fantastic way to read the Times. I mean, when I'm reading reports on Venezuela right now, for yes. example, I kind of think to myself, what would Gromyko say about this? Well, it's half yes. truth and half lies, but this is a well-balanced newspaper. Yes. So I, 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 I kind of think that uh, I even feel sorry sometimes for Donald Trump. I think he's right sometimes. <laughs> There's fake news that comes out. <laughs> Uh, and and I think that this you know question of how far social media can counteract that how 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 far we can go and I think that you're right n not to dismiss the possibilities there just because of Google and you know and all of the platform capitalism that we have and all yeah. the capacities for surveillance I mean if we don't take advantage of it we we will we'll be nowhere so. How do you see it featuring in something like uh, something we didn't talk about last time, but I know you're associated with, which is the Poor People's Campaign right now? How how does it feature uh, in that movement? Yeah. Um, so you know, this kind of revival of the Poor People's Campaign um, has been really important in you know bringing together networks of um, poor people's organizations from around the United States. And it's um, co-led by um, Reverend uh, William Barber, who was the leader of the um, Moral Mondays movement wow. in North Carolina, and Reverend Liz Theo Harris here in New York. And they, um, you know, in uh, June of 2018, did the, the largest and most expansive wave of civil disobedience uh, in U.S. history, that they had more than 40 um, state capitals where they had simultaneous civil disobedience going on. And they, um, you know, are very proactive on social media. And although they are getting, you know, some uh, corporate press attention that um, they do a lot, a lot, um, you know, with Facebook, with Twitter, with YouTube, Instagram. And it's been a really important way that people are able to sort of get the message unfiltered. And, you know, several times, um, both in June of 2018, as well as other times, they've been uh, hashtag poor people's campaign has been a, a nationally trending topic on Twitter. Uh -huh. And that has, you know, been really important in exposing people to this idea. And, I you know, especially, um, you know, in the United States where poverty is so internalized and personalized, and even when there are kind of small local struggles, they often feel isolated. And so the ability to connect um, these struggles together and, and, and actually build a, a larger narrative. And so, you know, they've taken up um, Dr. Martin Luther King's original Poor People's Campaign talked about the, the triple evils of racism and poverty and militarism. And, and they've added ecological devastation as a, as a fourth 
um, just given what's uh, what's happening in our world today. And, you know, the ability to, you know, speak to these kind of structural causes of, of poverty and inequality and racism has, I think, been really powerful. And much of that kind of original analysis and these kind of dialogues around, you know, a new way of looking at these ideas is happening online and, and, right. via, and via social media. Are there any uh, cautionary tales you would want to, to tell about doing this? I mean, because you've been around it for such a long time and, and uh, certainly in my not so uh, detailed involvement with these things, you, you often find yourself campaigning for something and then you realize down the line that this maybe wasn't such a good idea. Uh, and what, what are the dangers, you think, for the left in this field? Yeah, I mean, one thing I said I, I say is that um, I, I'm really not. Uh, I don't encourage like point and click activism, right? That I don't think that any campaign or struggle, if it's a hundred percent online, it. I mean, it's 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 not really anything that like that. I think what these organizations of you know organized poor people we've been talking about have shown is that you know there's basically this. You know, at best, you you can create this kind of virtuous circle of on the ground, in the street organizing with online organizing, and that it's actually finding that um, kind of dynamic between the two that will create, you know, a successful online viral campaign. But it it's it's actually grounded in in real work, right? It's actually yes, grounded right, in, in real right. in the streets struggle. And so I think you know there is a temptation to you know spend too much time on something like Twitter and like, you know, dunking on right wing morons is like, it's satisfying, but it, it doesn't really move politics. Right. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the, these interneted forms of struggle are like, uh, now an essential adjunct to organizing, but that organizing always has to be, you know, rooted in like a real place and a real community and real struggles. And it's about finding those kind of the dynamic interplay between the in the streets and the online, which is where successful campaigns come out of. Yeah, and I think, uh, for instance, there was all this hype around uh, the Arab Spring. Right. Somehow or other, it was a, an event constructed through the social media. Yeah. Um, I, I never, it didn't, it didn't strike me as, terribly plausible it probably played a role but yeah do you have any take on that yeah i mean <laughs> i mean judging by its results uh... well well but this is this is the this is the <laughs> right. point you know right. that, that that yeah social media can say all of these kinds of things yeah uh but if you're not organized on the ground and and there's not a ground force there that is yes. that is that is there then this comes to nothing and yes uh, there's the Arab Spring that got turned around into yeah. something completely different, and yeah, there was a social media component, but yes. uh, yeah, you know, and people well, trusted it, and they shouldn't. Yes, have trusted that's right. It, which is not to say it's irrelevant. Right, right, and I and I think the you know the ability to kind of game the system and to create kind of false viral campaigns is is it's much easier to do that than it has ever been before and so definitely you know the phenomenon of fake news and of these kind of astroturfed campaigns whether they're by you know intelligence agencies or private corporations or or private intelligence firms um you know are manipulating social media all day, every day, and that's real. Um, and so we have to have a real healthy skepticism as we approach it. But you know, I think, but but my caveat is though we shouldn't throw it out either, right? That we that we have to you know maintain a critical vig vigilance, but that there still are you know real opportunities here for getting counter hegemonic narratives out into the you know a wider audience than we otherwise could have. Behind this, there lies one other question, which is kind of you know, personally of great interest to me and I know to you, which is, okay, I come out and I come at this with a great deal of educational background and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm good at the mental labor. I'm pretty hopeless at the manual labor <laughs> side of things. Um, and there's always historically been 
this uh, way of thinking which suggests that manual is somehow or other inferior to the mental. And this interesting sort of uh, arguments can be made of the sort that says that uh, even if you got rid of private property rights, if you didn't get rid of the mental yeah. uh, manual distinction, you would end up with a class society. Um, how do people like us, and I'll put myself mainly in this, and you to some degree, but you're much, you know, you're much more in the middle than me. How, how, do, how do we make sure that, that, that what we're doing is not paternalistic? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question, something I've been trying to think about a lot as well. I mean, I think, you know, reflecting on this kind of Johnny Tillman model of organizing yeah. coming out of welfare rights and this insistence that, you know, those most directly impacted should be, you know, the ones at the microphone should not be just telling the sad stories, but giving the analysis and the strategy um, that that just, you know, we don't want to engage in just romanticism and pretend that that could just happen overnight. Like that takes resources, like that takes intentionality and time and training to be able to have people feel comfortable playing on, you know, playing these leadership roles. And I think um, fighting this division between manual and mental labor in, you know, at every chance we get is really important. And that, you know, it wasn't enough for me to say, hey, here I am, I have all these internet skills that other people don't have, and, you know, I'll, I'll manage this stuff, and you do the in the street stuff, and, you know, I'll, I'll give my interpretation of what you're doing over here to the world while, you know, you do the real work on the ground, right? That there was, that kind of stuff happens all the time, but, you know, the approach um, you know, that was demanded of me working in the, the context of this Johnny Tillman mile, uh, model of organizing was, no, you, what you're going to be engaged in is a training project. And so, you know, from day one, it was, you know, I was literally teaching folks without a high school education how to hand code HTML websites. Um, and they learned it um, fairly rapidly, teach folks how to do, you know, digital video production so that they literally had the tools to be able to tell their own stories. And I think that there's a real, um, you know, kind of personal empowerment that comes with, you know, having access to these high tech tools that can help, you know, increase people's confidence to, you know, play increased leadership roles. But I think it's incumbent. Um, I mean, I think everyone has a role to play in this movement to end poverty, but I think that um, respecting the leadership uh, of those at the bottom, of those who are the most directly affected, um, is crucial to building any kind of sustainable social movement. And that means that those of us that have, you know, different levels of skills or experience, it's incumbent on us to to socialize those, right, to teach them that, you know, one of the, the big mottos um, – of the National Union of the Homeless was uh, each one teach one, right? And this yeah. this was this model, each one teach one. Right. And th that if, if, if you know, you owe, right? If you know, you owe. And that means that you then, you know, would come and bring those skills to the collective where you're working with to increase, you know, all of our capacities. And it's that kind of point of view to take into these struggles. I think one of the things I, I, I've learned from you is that uh, it's very important to engage with, with these movements with whatever skills you have. Yeah. And you have obviously played an incredibly important role in allowing people means of expression. But you never use your power that you have in that area, which you do have, mm -hmm. uh, to fool around with the content. Right. Like the content should authentically come yeah. from them. Yeah. And you don't try and superimpose any content on them, but give expression. Mm -hmm. to their content and give them the tools that they can express their own content. Yeah. And that seems to me to be a kind of an incredible uh, message to send to those of us in academia who are uh, good at giving mode of expression but don't always uh, yeah. allow uh, the authenticity of that content yeah. which exists out there, uh, its own terrain of, of operation. Yeah. And, and I think that this is a very important a message to send to uh, all of those students, for example, these days who are getting hyped about mm -hmm. socialism and yeah. democratic socialism and all the rest of it, that 
yeah, it's great that they're doing what they're doing, but if it starts to become, well, as a democratic socialist, I can tell you what to do. <laughs> yeah. Try doing that with a welfare yes. rights organization right. or try and do right. that with the market. It won't work. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things they have to learn is how to appreciate the content which exists out there in the social movements and in, in the poor. Chris, it's been fantastic having you here. Um, you never know, I may get you back <laughs> and, and, and because I think this is some very important stuff we're, we're actually talking about. So thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Harry. I wish you would stop calling me Professor. <laughs> I'm no longer a professor of yours. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, okay, good. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.